And welcome everybody to this week's exciting episode. Sugar, Sugar spice, spice, and everything, and everything nice. 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 These were the ingredients chosen to create the perfect little girls. But Professor Utonium accidentally added an extra ingredient to the concoction, Chemical X. Thus the Powerpuff Girls were born. <laughs> Using their ultra superpowers, Blossom, Bubbles and Buttercup have dedicated their lives to fighting crime and the forces of evil. There you go. Uh, okay, w- what an intro. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, why not? Everyone likes the Powerpuff Girls. Yeah, yeah I guess. So I'm just getting ne- my screenshots ready. Ne- never ever watched the Power- Powerpuff Girls. I think that's a little after my time. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, what are we talking, 90s? I think. I haven't got a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, anyway. It was funny, quick story. When Powerpuff Girls were all the rage and Burger King was selling toys, uh, yeah. well, not selling, with the Happy Meal kind of things, they had the three girls and then the evil genius in it is a monkey with a huge brain uh, called Mojo Jojo. Right. And... When I was really, really young and the woman handed me Mojo Jojo, I started to cry and I said, I wanted Buttercup. Because <laughs> <laughs> she was my favourite Powerpuff girl. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't have a favourite. Um, I'll go with yours. Yeah. Um, well. So, uh, from that fantastic intro, what are, we, uh, what are we doing today, Josh? Today we are doing Admiral Bird. Ah, hence the seagull on the table. Yeah, Stephen Seagull. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Seagull. <laughs> yeah, he's our mascot for today. Does he know high keto? Do you uh, get <laughs> high keto? Because high, because he's a bird. High. Yeah, I think he does, and uh, he doesn't know karate chops, but he knows karate chips. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Well, we've got quite a lot to get through, my friend. Um, so should we just go straight into why, it? Why not? As always, go we're going to start with the history. So this is the important bit and the boring bit. <laughs> <laughs> so Richard well Evelyn Bird Jr., born October 25th, 1888, and sadly passed away March 11th, 1957. He was an American naval officer, a pioneering American aviator, a polar explorer and organiser of polar logistics. And he has had quite the career. Yeah, quite an innings as well, 1888 to 1957. That's not bad going. Yeah, yeah. Um, He served as a navigator and expedition leader across the Atlantic Ocean, a segment of the Arctic Ocean and the Antarctic Plateau. He is also known for discovering Mount Sidley, uh, the largest dormant volcano in Antarctica. Mm. Um, Bird claimed that his expeditions had been the first to reach both the North Pole and the South Pole by air. His belief that he reached the North Pole is disputed, which we will get to. Uh, He was a recipient of the Medal of Honor amongst many, many medals. Um, The United States Armed Forces' highest military decoration and the Navy Cross the second highest honour for valour given by the US Navy. And I'm not going to go into all of his medals because there is so many of them, but I am going to touch on a few. How many? I mean, some range between 12 (laughs) to 81, I saw. Oh, right. uh, And all ones in between. And he received little medals for little things through his career. But yeah, a lot of medals. A lot, a lot of medals. On Wikipedia, there was a whole section just for his medals. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. So on January 20th... So you possibly could have counted them on Wikipedia. I could have done, but it wasn't even all of them. Oh, right. It literally enough. wasn't all of them. It was There was just so many. And it explained why he got them. But I'll just touch on a few of the important ones. The okay. ones with the most prestige. But if you are interested in finding out all of Admiral Bird's medals, you can find them on Wikipedia. I just couldn't be bothered to list them all. (laughs) So on January 20th, 1915, Richard married Marie Donaldson Ames. He would later name a region of the Antarctic land he discovered called Marie Bird Land. (laughs) All right, okay. He could have come up with a better name, but, you know, he's doing it in her honour. And he named a mountain range called the Ames Range after her father. They had four children together. Richard Evelyn Bird, the third. (laughs) 
which has a, <laughs> <laughs> which has a nice <laughs> ring to it, doesn't it? Richard Evelyn Bird the Third. Yeah. Uh, Evelyn Bollingbird, Catherine Agnes Bird, and Helen Bird. So oh. I don't know why the fourth uh, daughter didn't get a middle name. I don't but, know. Um, so Bird was. I, I, think, I think I had a bolling bird feeding off my bird feeder the other day. Is there actually a bolling bird? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, maybe that's why the, the, the middle name Bolling makes sense. Um, bird was friends with Edsel Ford and his father, Henry Ford, who. The Ford Motor Company. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whose admiration of his polar exploits helped to gain Bird's sponsorship and financing for his various polar expeditions from the Ford Motor Company. Ah. But he wasn't the first person to drive a car to the North Pole. No, he certainly wasn't. No. <laughs> There's a lot of misfortune with Admiral Bird when it comes to being the first to do anything. And we'll, <laughs> we'll find out. A lot of his exploits are uh, disputed, are they, or just that one? So there's one, possibly two, that are uh, kind of debated whether it actually happened. Uh, but a lot of them, as we'll, as we'll get into it, a lot of them, he just had a lot of misfortune. Oh, okay. So, like, whether it was injury or something, someone beat him to it, if that makes right, sense. Right, okay. Um, but let's just go through the, the quick military stuff, the early parts of his career. Uh, this is before he just quickly became a pilot, so this is just going through his career. Yeah, from so the start. Yep. Bird attended the Virginia Military Institute for two years and transferred to the University of Virginia, then transferred to the United States Naval Academy, where he was appointed as a midshipman on May 28, 1908. And then on June 8, 1912, Bird graduated from the Naval Academy and was commissioned an ensign. Which ensign. Is ensign. Ensign, yeah. <laughs> Which I even put in brackets there is the next level from midshipman. Yeah. Uh, in the United States Navy. Later in July, he was assigned to the battleship USS Wyoming. And during his service in the Caribbean or Caribbean Sea, depending on how you say it, no right or wrong answer there, uh, Bird received his first letter of commendation and later a silver life saving medal for twice plunging fully clothed to the rescue of a sailor who had fallen overboard. Now, I know what you're thinking. I actually tried to look up because I couldn't work out whether it was the same bloke falling in twice <laughs> or if it was two different people because it just says rescued a sailor. Twice. Yeah. So I, d I don't know. I couldn't work it out. Either but... way, that netted him his first medal. Yeah. Ding! <laughs> One. <laughs> One check. <laughs> in April 1914, he transferred to the armored cruiser USS Washington and served in Mexican waters in June following the American intervention in April. Uh, this is the Battle of Veracruz, which lasted seven months between the US and Mexico related to the ongoing Mexican Revolution and also Mexico detained nine American sailors. Oh, okay. I didn't even know about this in, in history, but no. there was conflict between U.S. and Mexico at this time. Um, I'm pretty sure he also got a medal there. And then he, <laughs> he then transferred to the gunboat USS Dolphin, which oh. they could have come up with a cooler name. What's wrong with Dolphin? I don't know. I just think, like, stamp tramps when... Like <laughs> women get tattoos, you know. Like Will Young has a tattoo of a dolphin. So what as a tramp stamp? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's so unfortunate. So I just I don't know, and I also think Miami dolphins and stuff. I don't know. Dolphins aren't very menacing. You don't associate war and dolphins. Well, no. Yeah, <laughs> it just sounds lame. Yeah, I doesn't suppose it? since it's a gunboat. Yeah, the You'd... gunboat USS Dolphin. Yeah, it would have been better USS Bull Shark or something. It would have been. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. so much better, the bull shark. Yeah, see. Um, Get me in, on board, America. I'll name your ships for you. On board? Hey. Hey. Which brought Bird into contact with high-ranking officials and dignitaries, said that word right, including the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin Roosevelt. Ooh. He was promoted to lieutenant on June 8th, 1915. Ding! Three. And uh, during Bird's <laughs> assignment to Dolphin... He was commanded by future Fleet Admiral William D. Leahy, who served as Chief of Staff to President Franklin D. Roosevelt. So during World War II, oh, President Wilson, I messed that up, didn't I? Um, 
chief of staff to President Franklin D. Roosevelt during oh, wow. World War II. Now the full stop. Yes. So <laughs> Bird's last assignment before forced retirement was on the presidential yacht, the USS Mayflower. And the Mayflower oh. sounds more menacing to me than the USS Dolphin. I would say the Mayflower is obviously in homage to the boat that brought the Americans across from Europe to start with, isn't it? There you go. We're all learning something new today because you just taught me something. <laughs> so Really? Short... Yeah, I didn't know that. You were born in America and you don't know that the May Mayflower brought ah. the pioneers over. Ah, yes. <laughs> 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 I couldn't think of an excuse quick enough. <laughs> So shortly after the entry of the United States into the First World War in April 1917, Byrd oversaw the mobilization of the Rhode Island Naval Military. He was then recalled to active duty and was assigned to the Office of Naval Operations. Ding for. In, uh, oh, yeah, we're including medals and promotions. There yeah, you yeah. go. So Maybe. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, he, he rises the ranks very quickly. So autumn of 1917, he was sent to Naval Aviation School in Florida. And this is where he starts training to become a pilot. A pilot, yeah, yeah. He qualified as a naval aviator number 608 in June 1918. After the war, Byrd volunteered to be a crew member in the U.S. Navy's 1919 Aerial Transatlantic Crossing. The mission was historic as it was the first time the Atlantic Ocean was crossed by aircraft. It was decided that only men who had not served overseas would be allowed on the mission. Now, here's the first hiccup as to where he fell short. All right. They kind of discovered or realized that Bird had been overseas. Oh. So he wasn't actually allowed to go. Oh, fair so enough. So he, again, was beaten by Albert Reed, who completed the trip on May 18th, 1919, achieving the first transatl transatlantic flight. So fair enough. That's the first time where he was beaten to it. Yeah, fair enough. So in 1921, Bird volunteered again to attempt a solo non-stop crossing of the Atlantic Ocean. And Bird actually missed his train to take him to the airship on <laughs> August 24th, 1921. And luckily for him... Not the other people. The airship that he missed actually oh. broke apart mid-air, killing 44 of 49 crew members. This accident affected him deeply and inspired him to make safety his top priority in all future expeditions. Fair enough. So he got lucky on that one. Yeah, I'm guessing that's because airships were like um, uh, powered by hydrogen, weren't they? They were lifted by hydrogen. Very dangerous, and yeah, many of them just kind of went up in flames. Yeah. Killing yeah. All, everybody that was on board. Yeah. They had to do quite a lot of practice flights before doing these missions, which I discovered. So, like, um, it would practice flights would normally obviously just be like one person and they would right. never fly too high. It would always be like controlled, more yeah, controlled. Yeah. And then when they were ready and thought, yeah, this plane was good to go. They would then send it, but then sometimes they would still break. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, it's the early days of flight, a I suppose. Aviation, yeah, yeah. So, Bird commanded the aviation unit of the Arctic expedition to North Greenland, led by Donald B. McMillan, from June to October 1925. During this expedition, Bird made the acquaintance of Navy Chief Floyd Bennett and pilot Burnt Bullchin. <laughs> 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 and that's why I kept that secret until now. Burnt Bulchin. Yeah. His name is Burnt Bulchin. And he is that's a great name. He's a Norwegian pilot and um like Arctic plane uh, expert. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, that's his actual name, Burnt Bulchin. Uh so Bennett served as his pilot in his flight to the North Pole. The following year, and Bullchin went on to the. <laughs> he was a Bullchinian, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Is that a Star Trek reference? No, it's uh, Men in Black. Right? Men in Black, that's <laughs> it. And uh, Bullchin went on to be Bird's pilot for his flight to the South Pole in 1929. So remember Bennett and Bullchin because. <laughs> how can I forget them now? <laughs> yeah, how can you forget? But they were basically his, his main guys. Like, yeah, he yeah. really. They worked together as a team. They were. 
involved in a lot of flights together, co-piloting each other, and they had each other's back kind of thing. Um, they got some balls. <laughs> yeah, they, they, yeah, on their chins. So May 9th, 1926, financed by the Ford Motor Company, the trip to the North Pole was successful, lasting 15 hours and 57 minutes, a total of 1,535 miles. When they returned, Bird became a national hero. Congress promoted him to the rank of commander and awarding both Bird and Bennett the Medal of Honor. March 5th, 1927, he was presented a Tiffany Cross at the White House by President Calvin Coolidge. Big bing. Yeah. Fair play. Fun fact, my American grandfather is named after Calvin Coolidge. Oh, right. Yeah, Granddad Cal. Oh, not cool. <laughs> no, no, he was cool. But... <laughs> However, I hear you say, <coughs> doubts were cast about his first trip to the North Pole. Oh. Whether he actually made it to the North Pole. So, Bulchin, with. <laughs> <laughs> Would it be easier for you if I just called him Burn instead? No, I like no? Bulchin. Right. <laughs> so, Bulchin, with his knowledge of aeroplanes, he cast doubts and said that Bennett had confessed to him months after the flight that they did not actually reach the North Pole, Pole fully. Oh, he contesticled it. Yeah, supposedly, <laughs> yeah. He did. T I can't even say that word. Uh, so apparently he told him that. However, before Bennett's death in 1928, memoirs and various interviews confirmed Bird's version of the events that they did go to the North Pole. So Bennett told okay. Bulchin one thing, but then stuck to Bird's story and was adamant and said, no, Bird's right, this is what happened. Okay. So at, at this time, it's only Bulchin that, that, doubts it. that doubts it and has been telling people, well, you know, Bennett told me they didn't actually make it. So... Oh, in, uh, that's the thing. It's eight hours either way. How far would you actually go? If you actually calculated, thing. I don't know what the top uh, speed of the aeroplane that they used was, but you could mm. ca calculate the nautical miles that they would have covered and see yeah. if they actually were over the North Pole. And that's exactly what Dennis Rawlins did. So get out of my head, Poe. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was the other thing as well is... Um, I, I remembered this. I didn't even write this down. Uh, Bulchin actually found like uh, oil leaks and things on the plane when they got back. Right. So he was kind of calculating and thinking, well, th if there was things going wrong with the plane, there's no way they would have carried on risking it going all that way. So uh, they would right, have had yeah, to yeah. turn back as soon as they recognized there was things going yeah, wrong. Fair enough, yeah. So Dennis Rawlins actually looked at the official log of coordinates and sextant readings. Mm -hmm. Um, and concluded that Bird had reached 80% of the journey to the North Pole, but had to turn back due to plane errors. Fair enough. So this Dennis Rawlins guy kind of confirmed what Bulchin was saying. But... This it's... is a If the plane was having errors, now imagine if the, the compass or the nav ball or whatever they got in the, in the co cockpit started throwing out errors... They would probably assume that they were at the North Pole because of magnetic disturbance anyway, wouldn't they? Yes. So they'd have thought, yeah. yeah, we made it, and turn around. And that is exactly, again, get out of my head, pirate. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're on a roll. That's twice today. <laughs> twice well, that is essentially minutes. what's happened, and yeah. that's why it's still debated today as to whether he made it to the North Pole. So even with... Because I think you know, even today... Um, commercial aircraft don't fly over the North Pole because of mm. the magnetic disturbance that it can throw on the instruments. That is very possible. I yeah. mean, some people believe because, because there's a hole in the, in the Earth, you know, for the mm. hollow Earth theory, theorists. Um, yes. But I don't believe that one to start with. I, I think probably uh, magnetic disturbances are very possible. I think it's possible as well. So there's no line drawn under that one. It's still up for debate whether he was actually the first person to do that or Fair enough. To, to actually make it to the North yeah. Pole. Uh, in 1927, Bird was one of several aviators who attempted to win the Ortigue Prize for making the first non-stop flight between the United States and France. Ding. So during... Uh, <laughs> that's another one, yeah. 
during the practice flight, it crashed, injuring Bird and Bennett. And as the plane was being repaired, a guy called Charles Lindenberg won the prize by completing this historic flight on May 21st, oh. 1927. <laughs> so that's the second time that he got beaten. Got stolen to... from him. Yeah. But this didn't hold Bird back. He continued his quest to cross the Atlantic nonstop and arriving at France, they again had to crash land on a gold on Gold Beach due to cloud cover. Right. Um, Bird and his crew received, were received as heroes by French Prime Minister Raymond Poincare because there was no fatalities. He safely brought it down and crash landed. Fair play, yeah. So the French Prime Minister was like, yep, they're heroes. Uh, Pating, another. Pating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <sorry. Pating. laughs> On their return to the US, Bird was uh, rewarded with the Distinguished Flying Cross Award. <laughs> but Bullchin was not awarded as the award was only for armed services, not civilians. Oh, yeah. Well, I suppose and it would be, yeah. At that point, Bullchin wasn't part of the, the service. Of the military, yeah. So I'm just going to throw it out there. Maybe that links as to maybe, possibly... Yeah, allegedly, there could have been maybe a little bit of resentment. jealousy, yeah, resentment, resentment yeah. from Bullchin as to why he didn't believe him and things like that. Yeah, it maybe. Just, it might play into it. I don't know. Because he wasn't getting any of the medals. Exactly. But he was there with Bird for a lot of these journeys, but he wasn't getting the recognition necessarily. Yeah, fair enough. Neither was Bennett, really. Um, 1928, Bird's first expedition... Probably because whoever was awarding the medals couldn't say his name without laughing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But bullshit. <laughs> so 1928, Bird's first expedition to the Antarctic took place involving two ships, three planes, snowshoes, dog sleds and snowmobiles. They set up camp in the Antarctic and called it... Little America. <laughs> oh, how inventive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Because they're patriots. So <laughs> to increase the interest of the youth in Arctic exploration, because there wasn't enough <laughs> <laughs> risking their lives in Arctic exploration. Wonder why. Yeah. Um, they select like everybody's chose... to-do list, that. No, exactly, yeah. Um, I think I feel like Arctic expo exploration is one of them things, either you're into it or you're not. Yeah. You know? Um, but they chose a 19-year-old man called Paul Allman Sippel. He went on to accompany Bird in all five of Bird's expeditions afterwards. What, to the Antarctic? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he was actually very interested in it. Fair play. And he was 19 at the time when they employed him. So, November 28th, 1929. My birthday. Not the year, but the day. Uh, South Pole and back in 18 hours, 41 minutes. And December 21st, 1929, at 41 years old, he became the youngest admiral in the history of the United States Navy, one of three people to achieve this without being a captain first. Fair play. Ba-ding! Yeah, so <laughs> another one, double ba-ding, because he skipped a rank. <laughs> yeah. He went straight over captain to admiral. And uh, as far as I know, when I looked up, he is still uh, considered the youngest uh, admiral oh, at, fair at 41. Now, we're almost there. We're almost there. We're almost at the uh, juicy bits. Right. Well, I don't know about you, but I think Bullchin's pretty juicy. Bullchin, so. very juicy. <laughs> so the second expedition uh, from 1933 to 1934, uh, Bird actually almost died in carbon monoxide poisoning. Oh. From it. Uh, from a camp stove, I believe. Yeah. Uh, he was rescued and... As a result of this, uh, he had a postage stamp made to raise funds for the next expedition. And it was actually the President Roosevelt that created this stamp because they were buddies because they met yeah, back yeah, in the yeah, day. Yeah. And all of the proceeds and everything, uh, the stamp cost 53 cents at the time. Wow. was to help to That's the next expensive expedition. expensive stamp at that time. Yeah, because I think he felt bad for him as well. He almost died and stuff. So he was like, I'll, I'll help you out with my presidency. Um, so a little fun fact there for you. In late 1938, Bird visited Hamburg and was invited to join in the German Antarctic expedition, but smartly declined as Hitler was currently serving as Führer of the German Reich since 1934. <laughs> yeah. 
And he then went on to invade Poland the, the year after. The very next year, yeah, yeah. So kind of good that he didn't join the uh, the Germans yeah, there at yeah, that time. Yeah, allied Nazi otherwise, yeah. Uh, so Byrd's third expedition was the first one financed by the United States government. And the project included extensive studies of geology, biology, meteorology, and exploration. So Fair basically, enough, yeah. timesing everything by 100. Yeah. We want to know the everything whole about expedition. it. Um, and I've written down here, as you can see, because I was getting tired of all the awards. More, awa more awards were won. <laughs> Legion of Merit. There was a large boat ding, explosion. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> yeah, there was a large boat explosion where 24 people died that he was there saving people's lives and things like that. Right. So he got more medals and he got a lot of medals during this time, but I'm not going to go through them. So then we skip to Operation High Jump, which was the fourth Antarctic expedition, which lasted six to eight months. It included six helicopters, six flying boats. Don't really know what they are. Right. I thought it meant the hover... Things no, that, it's yeah. the the um, fuselage of the aeroplane is boat shaped. Um, oh, yeah, so it can land on water, and rather than having wheels, it's got like skiddy things. Oh, you know I do know I mean? the ones you yeah. mean. Yes, yes. So six helicopters, six flying boats, two seaplane tenders, fifteen aircrafts, and four thousand personnel. Wow, yeah, fair play. And December thirty first, nineteen forty six, they had explored half the size of America recording 10 new mountain ranges. And when they got back, this is where it starts to get a little bit juicy. When they got back and he was doing interviews and doing the rounds, he had a lot of concern about other countries, including America, having war over the Antarctic. So claiming it or Right, yeah. It, so is this like sort of where the Antarctic Treaty... Um, came into I assume so, it, yeah, yeah. Where they cause... declared it a, a, an international... Um, uh, like a... Call, a nature reserve. I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a zone where they all have like... Um, yeah. Yeah, I get yeah. Um But that was his biggest concern, was he thought that there was going to be war over the Antarctic or including... You have to go fair Antarctic. distance out of your way to be fighting a war mm. in the Antarctic. Yes, but I think... That will all make sense in a minute. So in 1948, the U.S. Navy produced a documentary about the expedition and about Bird named The Secret Land, and it won an Academy Award for Best Documentary. It included okay. real footage right, and yeah, also yeah. dramatizations about what happened in certain events. Okay. Uh, December 8th, 1954, in an interview, Bird said the Antarctic in the future would be the most important place in the world for science. Spooky. I wonder how far in the future he was talking. Yeah, I mean, it's only 1954, so not too sure. I, mean, I know a lot of science goes on down there nowadays. Mm. Yeah, isn't uh, there like, um, I, I've read somewhere that there's actually like diseases, like smallpox and things that are like underneath glaciers possibly. and stuff. And it's only a matter of time before they get released. Possibly, yeah. And just quickly, the last thing that he done um, before he fully retired was the Operation Deep Freeze, which was to set up permanent military bases across the Antarctic during the 1955 and 1956. And then he passed away in 1957 due to heart failure. Oh, fair enough. Now... This is where... I would imagine that America really needs military bases all across Antarctica. No, no, you would think so, but they've got like 180-odd bases across the world anyway, yeah. but then accuse other countries of terrorism. But I'm not going to go We're into another into rant. One, We're no. not going into it. So after his death, his son found a secret diary that Bird had written. Oh. Yes. Here comes the juicy part. Richard Evelyn Bird III had found a diary. <laughs> now. <laughs> did, did it contain some words? Yeah. Richard Bird, he got the word, word, word. <laughs> <laughs> well, a bird, bird, bird. Let's no, 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 no. <laughs> Everybody listening to this now has got that stuck in their head. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Uh, so I'm going to read the the diary Go for and it. I'll, I'll just say it's a log it's like a flight log okay so but before we get into the actual flight log with the hours and the times and things 
he writes the opening paragraph in this diary. I must write this diary in secrecy and obscurity. It concerns my Arctic flight of the 19th day of February in the year of 1947. There comes a time when the rationality of men must fade into insignificance and one must accept the inevitability of the truth. I am not at liberty to disclose the following documentation at this writing. Perhaps it shall never see the light of public scrutiny, but I must do my duty and record here for all to read one day. In a world of greed and exploitation, of certain of mankind can no longer suppress that which is truth. And that was the first thing he wrote in this diary. Okay, that's compelling. Now, it says, Flight Log, Base Camp Arctic, 2nd of the 19th, 1947. Now, I'm just going to glaze over this. So the, the first bit of it is just all normal, what you would expect in a flight log. In a flight log. log, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just to give an example, it says, All preparations are complete for our flight northward, and we are airborne with fuel tanks at 0, 6, 10 hours. And then it goes on, fuel mixture, starboard engine, you know, adjustment made, radio Headings. check. yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, note slight of oil leak in starboard engine, oil pressure indicator seems normal, you know, stuff like that. So then we get to zero nine ten hour is literally 10 past 9, isn't it? So yes. Yeah. I can just say the time. So yeah. 10 past 9, he says, vast ice and snow below. Note correlation of yellowish nature and disperse in a linear pattern. Altering course for a better examination of this color pattern below. Note a reddish or purple colour. Circle this area two full turns and return to the assigned compass heading. Position check made again to base camp. Relay information concerning correlations in ice and snow. Both magnetic and gyro compasses beginning to gyrate and wobble. So at this point, this compass is going a bit nuts. Okay. We are unable to hold our heading by instrumentation. Take bearing with sun compass. Yet all seems well. The controls are seemingly slow to respond and have sluggish quality, but there is no indication of icing or freezing. Maybe and then, it lost oil pressure? Possibly. It did mention something like oil? And then we get to 10 o'clock. We are crossing over the small mountain range and still proceeding northward, as best as can be ascert ascertained. Ascertained, yeah. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the centre portion. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. To the port side are great forests growing on the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is back and forth. I alter altitude to 1400 feet and execute a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or a type of tight-knit grass. Ooh, wow. In Antarctica. Yeah, and he says, I cannot see the sun anymore. Oh, fair play. The only parts of Antarctica that I know of that aren't just fully ice are the um, dry valleys. But what? that's on the coastal region. And he doesn't oh. sound like he's a coastal region, region to me. No, I would assume not because he's... He's seeing nothing but snow and ice and then all of a sudden... Green trees and... Yeah, weird. Yeah. He says, we make another left turn and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below us. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible, yet there it is. Decrease altitude to 1,100 10, feet and take binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed. It is definitely a mammoth-like animal. Report this to base camp. Encountering more roll this is at ten thirty now. So he says encountering more rolling green hills. The external temperature indicator reads seventy four degrees Fahrenheit. Continuing on our heading now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, seventy four degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, okay. Oh yeah. it gets weirder. It gets yeah. weirder. Navigation instruments seem normal now. I'm puzzled over their actions. Attempt to contact base camp. Radio is not functioning. Countryside below is more level and normal, if I may use that word. Ahead we spot what seems to be a city. This is impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. My God, if our port and starboard wings are a strange type of aircraft, they are closing rapidly alongside. They are dish-shaped and have a radiant quality to them. They are close enough now to see markings on them. I wasn't going to include this, but I think it's important to say right. that he says the 
the markings look very similar to a swastika, but they're not swastikas. It just okay. says it looks similar. Well, uh, I think the swastika is it's a, a re reversed version of, yeah, it's like a Buddhist symbol, yeah. isn't it? So Which do doesn't it mean like peace? Or something like that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We are caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. Ooh, Force tractor field. beam. Tractor beams. <laughs> 1135. Our radio crackles and a voice comes through in English with what perhaps is a slight Nordic or German accent. The message is, Welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax. Admiral, you are in good hands. I note the engines of our plane have stopped running. The aircraft is under some strange control and is now turning itself. The controls are completely useless. 11.40 hours. Another radio message received. We begin the landing process now, and in moments the plane shudders slightly and begins a descent, uh, as though caught in some great unseen elevator. The downward motion is negligible, and we touch down with only a slight jolt. 11.45. I am making a hasty last entry in the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot toward our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance is a large shimmering city pulsating with rainbow hues of colour. I do not know what is going to happen now, but I see no signs of weapons on those approaching. I hear now a voice ordering me by my name to open the cargo door. I comply. End log. Oh, is that it? That's No, no, no. Oh. So that was the end of the log. So that's the, the actual diary part. Okay. What are your thoughts on that before I quickly just read some of the transactions to, between uh, to be honest that is less fantastical than some of the reports i've heard of admiral bird mm -hmm. like the crystal city and yeah the... yeah i think if i can remember rightly i heard that his plane flew into a cave and encountered a crystal city and uh then obviously yeah landed got out and was supposedly uh, introduced to aliens. Well, the aliens is the next bit. Oh, okay. But I think you are right. I, th I, I assume that people maybe have, uh, what's the word, like embellished or exaggerated maybe parts of the story. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it, they've changed it slightly to make it more interesting because this is the actual log that yeah, yeah, I found. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe they've just made it more interesting. But that is maybe. pretty similar to to what you've heard, like the colours of hue and things with the city. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like a crystal city to me. Yeah. So from this point, I write all the following events here from memory. It defies the imagination and would seem all but madness if it had not happened. So this is all Admiral Byrd's memory. This is what he says happened. Uh, I don't know if I should read the whole thing. I sh it's quite long. Uh, I'll... Read yeah, just bits. skim over it or something. Uh, the radio man and I are taken from the aircraft and we are received in a most cordial manner. We are then boarded to a small platform-like conveyance with no wheels. It moves us towards the glowing city with great swiftness. As we approach, the city seems to be made of a crystal material. Soon we arrive at a large building that is a type I have never seen before. It appears to be right out of design board of Frank Lloyd's right or perhaps more correctly, out of Buck Rogers. We oh, are... so quite futuristic looking. Yeah. yeah. We are given some type of warm beverage that tasted like nothing I have ever savoured before. It is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, we then proceed down a long hallway that is lit by a rose-coloured light that seems to be emanating from the very walls themselves. One of the beings motions for us to stop before a great door. Over the door is an inscription that I cannot read. The great door slides noiselessly open, and I am beckoned to enter. One of my hosts speaks, Have no fear, Admiral. You are to have the, an audience with the master. Ooh. I step inside, and my eyes adjust to the beautiful color, color, coloration <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be filling the room completely. Then I begin to see my surroundings. What greeted my eyes is the most beautiful sight of my entire existence. It is, in fact, too beautiful and wondrous to describe. 
It is exquisite and delicate. I do not think this these exists a human term that can describe it in any detail with justice. My thoughts are interrupted in a cordial manner by a warm, rich voice of melodious quality. Melodious. <laughs> melodious. <yeah. laughs> I bid you welcome to our domain, Admiral. I see a man with delicate features and with the etching of years upon his face. He is seated at a long table. He motions me to sit down in one of the chairs. After I am seated, he places his fingertips together and smiles. He speaks softly again and conveys the following. We have let you into here because you are of noble character and well known on the surface world, Admiral. Surface world? I half gasp under my breath. Yes, the master replies with a smile. You are in the domain of the Ariani, the inner world of the earth. We shall not long delay your mission, and you will be safely escorted back to the surface and for a distance beyond. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. Our interest rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. It was at that alarming time we sent our flying machines, the Flugerads, to your surface world to investigate what your race had done. That is, of course, past history. Now, my dear Admiral, we continue on. You see, we have never interfered before in the race's wars and barbarity. But now we must, for you have learned to tamper with a certain power that is not for man, namely that of atomic energy. Our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world, and yet they do not heed. Now have you been chosen to witness here that our world does exist. You see, our culture and science are many thousands of years beyond your race, Admiral. I interrupted. But what does this have to do with me, sir? The master's eyes seemed to penetrate deeply into my mind, and after studying me for a few moments, he replied, Your race has now reached the point of no return. For there are those among you who would destroy your very world rather than relinquish their power as they know it. I nodded, and the master continued. I'm not going to go into the rest of that. It's a little bit of a history lesson from the master. Oh, okay, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Um, and then it just kind of goes on to them having a conversation about legendary treasures and races, cultural things, the dark ages, and basically wisdom. He's bestowing right. wisdom upon Admiral Byrd. Um, and then he says, you will have learned the futility of war and its strife. And after that time, certain of your culture and science will be returned for your race to begin anew. You, my son, are to return to the surface world with a message the message I have given to you. Um, and then, yeah, it's the same kind of thing. Um, I don't really want to go through it Stop all. messing with the power of the atom. You, you're, um, you're putting humanity on the brink of self-destruction. Yeah, and then he just, yeah. he then goes on to describe how, you know, when they left, all the what happened with the doors. And yeah, it yeah. kind of just describes it. But that's pretty much the juicy part of it, right. if you know what I mean. I don't want to... You can find these transcripts online and read the whole thing yourself because it is quite long, so I'm not going to sit here and read, oh, that might have to, yeah. read the whole thing. But it's it's very, very interesting that that was found on a, a secret diary after Admiral Byrd's death. So what do you think yeah. about that then, Pirate? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, well, like I say, I've, he I've heard of the, the story of Admiral Byrd uh, before, mm -hmm. uh, I think it might have been on like Ancient Aliens or something like that on on telly. Um, they they've covered him, not in quite as much detail as that. Although in fairness, the, the, because it's obviously the master said that you know the, the, they were beneath the surface. That mm. again um, gives credence to the story that I heard before or the version of it that I heard beforehand. Like Hollow Earth. <laughs> Is it Hollow Earth here? I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, underground alien yeah. beings, basically. Um, I wonder if... Because it didn't actually mention him flying into a hole in the ground. No. Did it? it just like rolling hills, green hills, mammoths underneath it, you know? Which, yeah. Uh, any aerial shot or satellite footage of Antarctica, you won't see none of that. Mm. So, I think from what I could gather, it was as if he went through mountains and then into valleys, and then he he slowly descended in 
in between mountains and valleys is the way that I, that's how I interpreted it yeah. when, I, when I read it. So no big hole flying through necessarily. No, but, but it's, it's, it's a weird one because obviously scientifically, the only thing that we know, the only creatures that we know of that are endemic to Antarctica are penguins. Mm. And I think, I believe there's some kind of um, midge, like a little fly. <laughs> that's endemic to Antarctica. And those are the only two species that are actually born and live in Antarctica. Mm. So mammoths, generally, they're found the opposite end of the world, up ne near the North Pole and Russia and that sort of thing. Um, with there being no land mass uh, bridging the gap between anywhere else and Ant Antarctica, it's a fair stretch to make that claim. That there would be mammoths there, but if that's what he saw, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mm. second guess him. He's a very decorated military man. You'd have thought that that would be a trustworthy testament, wouldn't you? That's why I'm so torn, because we've gone through his history, and he's got so many accolades and medals, and he saved people's lives, and he comes across as a, a very noble, good person. And is that why this? race of beings chose him to be the messenger yeah because coming from him uh it probably has more sway mm. yeah yeah and he clearly has a passion for the antarctic oh yeah yeah obviously he'd, he'd yeah done so many expeditions and he was obsessed with it oh I mean, yes yeah, it's, it's a difficult one it's it it's is. it's random to because this this whole story kind of went from being like there's just this military guy that had all these accolades and done all this great stuff and then all of a sudden there's a secret diary that involves aliens and mammoths it's such a yeah. such a weird turn and so, but he in fairness kept it secret he said he doesn't yeah. it wasn't going to uh, allow it to be published or whatever until after his death obviously that's out, that's out of his hands then isn't it but yeah, he which kept makes it, it seem more believable to me. It does, yeah, mm. yeah, because he didn't want his reputation in tatters. Yeah, by coming out with a story like this, and that's what his whole life has been: is making this legacy and this yeah. reputation of being the first to do this and first to do that. And yeah, it's was, an odd one. Was there any kind of handwriting analysis? Because you said that this was um, released after his death, and it was mm. his son that actually released yeah. it was there any handwriting analysis done on the on the secret diary against his his known logs do we know that or? i didn't look that up no no i didn't get that far into into that i was, i think we've just got to take it as believable that it was his logs then i suppose and i don't know if this actually goes with the research about the crystal city and stuff but there is reports of a base in the antarctic that is completely self-reliant with energy it has complete reusable energy just oh, powering right. it all the time so how are they getting that power if allegedly those rumors are true of this base how are they doing that in the middle of ice and snow without like generators and things like that so well obviously some sort of technology well, antarctic they'll have sunlight for six months of the year hmm. so the solar panels could um create energy that way I mean, uh, don't panel. think that people actually stay there over the Antarctic winter, or at least the scientists don't. don't. I don't know if the military do, but cause it, because of the wind speeds and it just mm. gets so hostile. It's I a very know. hostile environment. I think if it's a secret base, I feel like, well, not so secret, but just rumours of this base... I don't think solar power would be enough to power no. everything they're using, all the machinery. So. The, 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 the alien base, it would make sense if aliens were going to create a base here on the Earth, that mm -hmm. they would do it far away from normal human population. And you don't really get yeah. much further than Antarctica, do you? No. And I don't think a lot of people want to go there. No. <laughs> so, so, no, I'll... I'll um... So putting it to the rating, what would you give Admiral Byrd? Well, because he's such a highly decorated, accredited pilot, I'm going to give him 8.6. 8.6. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. There is a little bit of uh, 
a doubt with everything. Always, for me. yeah. Um, I mean, the fact that they kind of not proved it, but there's high speculation that he never actually made it to the North Pole the first time and got 80% of the way. Things like that. There is a little bit of doubt for me. So I'm going to go with you on the high eight. So I'm going to give it an 8.8. Oh, okay. Because I really like the story, and I I would love it if mammoths and aliens and everything and that part of it was true, but I don't know. I'd it love seems, it, but there is that seed of doubt, and seems there? very far fetched, doesn't it? Yeah, like, I don't know. It's, but then uh, yeah, I don't. I just really don't know the fact that it goes from a normal flight log to suddenly mammoths and then aliens and stuff. It's very intriguing to me, but I just don't know how much of it I believe. I don't know. No, I really don't. Fair enough. I am the most 50 50 man in podcasting. So <laughs> I've got fair, no. Idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess you are. Yeah. <laughs> Does that mean our average is 8.7? Yes. Perfect. I'm happy with that. 8.7 for Admiral Bird. Lovely job. <laughs> and thank you, Stephen Seagull, for guiding us yes. all the way. Yeah. He just, he's been uh, aloft. <laughs> yes. I think he was just enjoying story time. He was. Yeah. Admiral Bird's his hero. Yeah, so. obviously. Not Steven Seagull. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, what, do you, what do you think at home? Would do, you, uh, do you believe Admiral Bird or do you think it's all a load of hogswash? Mm. Let us know. Write in paranormality. Yeah. UK? paranormality.uk at gmail.com yeah sorry doubted myself then <laughs> um, <laughs> let's do it again one more time for the people paranormality.uk <laughs> at gmail.com there you go and uh, let us know if you believe it or you don't believe it or you can comment on uh, Spotify these days can't you and Ooh. YouTube so let's make that our call to action yeah give yeah us, give, give us, us a, a mention download, on, give us a mention and on Spotify yeah. I believe it says, uh, comes up with, uh, did you enjoy this episode or something? Yeah. And yeah, just leave a little comment there. Give us we'll, a rating. We'll publish it It's uh, so everybody else can read. It'd be great. Yeah. And until next week, I've been Pirate. I'm Josh. This has been Paranormality UK. Ta-ta. Ooh, ta-ta. <laughs> that was me being cold. <laughs> <laughs>